So welcome to the next episode of Endoscopy Essentials. It's actually not only one episode, it's a series of episodes, and I'm more than happy to welcome Michael Burke. He's Mr. Polypectomy, Mr. Colon EMR, Mr. Colonoscopy, but you're actually doing everything in endoscopy, aren't you? Except the US. Except yeah. the US, okay. <laughs> Yeah. Which is another debate how much yeah. you need it. But yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, so our aim today and then the next uh, series is um, to talk about large colonic polyps, not the pedunculated one. Michael, where have they gone? Yeah, uh, I think for us, I mean, they're, they're, we're all working in a referral practice. So um, we don't see them so often because the community gastroenterologists remove them. Um, but perhaps they are truly less frequent. We, we don't really know. I know in the Munich polypectomy study, 4,000 cases, I, I, you probably remember offhand, but there was maybe 10, 20% pedunculated yes, polyps. Yes. Yeah, so. Which we were surprised already at that time that there was a few. Yes, yeah. So they've become much less frequent for reasons we don't understand, most probably. So we, we forget the pedunculated ones. Maybe mm. we have an extra session on them and we take the flat ones and there's this confusing terminology. It's laterally spreading something. Yeah, I think um, terminology should be the friend of the naive uh, non-user. You should be able to look at a topic and understand the terminology easily. And the way the terminology with uh, large flat polyps has grown up if you come from the outside, it's impossible to follow. Originally, the term was LST, laterally spreading tumour, which was a term that was pioneered by the Japanese because they were the first to uh, identify and indeed develop techniques to characterise and resect these lesions. But the term tumour in LST implies cancer. And of course, most of these lesions aren't cancer. More than 90% aren't cancer. So we moved away from that to the term of LSL, laterally spreading lesion, which didn't really take off. And the Europeans were going with the large non-pedunculated colorectal polyp, and that's where we are now, the large non-pedunculated colorectal polyp, which would be the same as saying the not small um, <laughs> non-pedunculated uh, polyps in the colon, not in the rectum, you know, so it's... It, which the, is the most complicated abbreviation, by the way. Um, correct. Yeah. So it's non-pedunculated, it's large, and large starts above two centimeters. Large starts at, at 20 millimeters and mm -hmm. above. And they comprise about 2% of all polyps seen on, on screening colonoscopy. We know that from a number of different sources. Probably the best study was the, the Flynn study, the Flat Lesions Italian Network study, I think was published in endoscopy in the late 2000s, 2008, 2007. And um, they found a prevalence of about 2% uh, of large flat lesions in screening procedures. Okay, so we are going into the colon. We find something which doesn't have a stalk, and it's large in, mm. by feeling. So what, what, what do we do? What, what are the parameters? So step one is always to... Um, there, there's, there's a few things that are very important. Um, first of all, don't forget that this, this is possibly not the only polyp. So always don't let the, the noise dominate the overview of the, lead, of the case. So be mindful that you may have seen other polyps, the patient may have serrated polyposis or another condition. That's step one. The next step is to clean the lesion thoroughly. Don't start evaluation of a lesion until it's cleaned thoroughly. And ideally, uh, it should be positioned where the fluid pool is not covering it. So you may need to roll the patient so that you can see what's going on adequately. Uh, so you need a powerful water jet, you need to clean the lesion very thoroughly, and you need to take note of where you are in the colon, you should have a straight scope. So when the, the scope exits the anus, it falls flat on the bed, uh, it's, and, and, and you know you've got you've got one-to-one, -one, forward and back, you know exactly where you are in the colon, because location in the colon influences the risk of submucosal invasive cancer and the, the, uh, uh, the uh, choice of resection technique. So once you've cleaned the, the lesion thoroughly. Um, and this is always possible, or do you need these sophisticated double balloon devices occasionally to, uh, to stabilize the scope? No, of course, it, a, a good colonoscopist should be able to get a stable okay. position always. Always, yeah, good, yeah. good message. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, so then clean the lesion, and then, then we can uh, make an assessment of, of its edges. Are the edges poorly defined or crisp? 
If they're poorly defined, then we need to be thinking, you know, could it be a serrated lesion? Was there adherent mucus? A tip to finding serrated lesions is if you see mucus adherent on the bowel wall defying gravity, you need to, so if the fluid pool's here and there's a, there's a, a big patch of mucus up here, there's a good chance there's a serrated lesion under that, under that spot. We'll, we'll, we'll look at images In a little minimum. bit later. Yeah. But just, just about the basics. So where is the lesion located? How, how, how do you go about? Yeah, well, you need, as you're inserting the scope, you should, you should know where you are. And, and that's a good colonoscopist knows where they are. People often say it's very vague above the sigmoid and uh, there are huge mistakes and surgery yeah. done on the wrong place in, in uh, ancient years. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, because the, you, you, to, to make an evaluation of where you are, <clears throat> of course, beyond the sigmoid, and depends yeah. on the anatomy of the colon and the left colon, how loose the mesentery is and so on. But you want to know that you've got a straight scope, which means that the scope comes out of the anus and falls flat on the bed like that, um, and you've got one-to-one. -one. You can move forward two centimetres outside the uh, abdomen is two centimetres inside the colon. Which you ideally achieve when you are in the cecum and then you start measuring. You don't have to go to the cecum to know where you are, but you've, you've, of course you've always got to do a full colonoscopy and sometimes your position on a polyp may be so much better if you've gone to the cecum shortened or you want to shorten before you leave the left colon. I always teach that never ever, almost never ever, move beyond the splenic without having a straight scope. So two thirds of your insertion time should be spent in the left abdomen uh, below the splenic. And then once you've got all that sorted, everything else becomes very easy. But then how, how do you go? My, maybe a naive question, where, where is the polyp? Let's say sigmoid is easy, it's 40 centimeters, but then you have something like, I don't know, 55 centimeters, where are you? Well, so, so between 40 and 50, uh, you're always, you should be at the splenic if you've got a straight scope. And it's, it, it's amazing. It doesn't vary so much on, on individual size, but between 40 and 50 centimetres. And then you can see the triangular folds of the transverse. You know you go around the corner. It's a sharp corner. Um, so there's lots of clues as to where you are. Right flexure? Right flexure. Of course, you go across. Um, you've usually got the, the, the deep transverse dip, which is, which is bigger in, in men who've got large protuberant abdomens with lax abdominal tone. And, and then you come up to the hepatic, uh, shorten, come down. But sometimes you need to confirm that you're at the hepatic or, or proximal transverse by going to the cecum and coming back slowly. Do you advise that people are training with those localizers? We, we, do, we don't use them, no. but I think for the beginner, I think it's, it's very handy to, to know where you are. Um, but uh, it's not something that we have in, in routine practice in our center, but I know that it's, it's very highly prevalent in the United Kingdom. I'm not sure about the rest of Europe. Northern, Northern European countries as well. Mm. But maybe it's a good thing for training, that if you oh, so. see the effect yeah. of straightening and where, where the location actually is. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so. But, but just, um, I think the key thing is, you know, you're, you're not playing tennis when you're doing colonoscopy. You, you, you're riding with an instrument and you have to develop this ability to feel within your fingers the tension in the scope. The scope, when you have a straight scope, the scope should be floppy. You should feel that it's just, it's like a piece of, you know, licorice <laughs> in your fingers. You know, it, it will just, yeah. Okay. Mm. So we got the location right, presumably. Mm. What about size? How, how do you measure size? Yeah. So. Um, in the beginning, you need to estimate size against uh, something of known size. Of course, new scopes are coming that will estimate size for us. Um, so, uh, you know, if, if it's a small polyp, you're going to use a 10 millimeter cold snare. So you can you begin by having experience at estimating size against the size of that snare. And after you've done six months of that, 12 months of that, you get very good at estimating size, three millimeter, five, seven, so on. Um, for larger lesions, again, we're using a larger snare, and but oftentimes it is an estimate. But if, you, if you're in doubt, you can take the width of the snare and apply it against the surface of the polyp and measure laterally to get the maximum size. We have a slide here which shows us the size categories. Is that what matters? Yes. I, yeah, I think so. Um, so, in fact, this slide is a little older from, from the previous guideline, which was the European guideline from 20. Uh, 17, but below nine millimeter now is all considered as one. So th those lesions are all going to be removed by cold snare resection. And they are non-advanced. 
it's very unlikely. Depending on histology. Yeah. Of course, but, but, but yeah. Yeah, so mm -hmm. so a lesion that's less than 10 millimetre, the chance that it has um, uh, cancer within it is something like 0.016% or something. It's very low. So, and of course, you're going to look at that small lesion and see that it's homogeneous and then you can resect it uh, generally on block, but it, it it doesn't matter. You can take it in two pieces, yeah. So the 10 millimetre cutoff is important because it's the definition boundary between non-advanced and advanced lesions, at least size-wise? It's it's a, it's more importantly the the boundary between what can be removed reliably uh, mm -hmm. by cold snare excision, generally on block with a good margin, versus you know once you get above ten you're going to have to if you're doing cold which is going to become much more popular um, between ten and twenty then then you know you need to make a, what we call as an oligo piecemeal resection several pieces of tissue come out yeah. So, so I think we see you always think it outcome-wise, right? So what are we doing, not classification-wise? We get lost in morphology and uh, yeah. 17 different stages, A to D. It's what are we doing with the lesion? Exactly. That's yeah, important so important thing. Yeah. So, so it's, it's one centimeter below and above, and then the next cutoff is two centimeters. Yeah, millimeters. two centimeters, yeah. yeah. And you measure it with a 15 millimeter polyp snare? Generally, or we're millimeter? using a 15 millimeter yeah. snare for a more complex resection. And in the training, is it part that the there has to be an assessment by the trainee and then he looks at his pathology? It's not precisely the same, but at least uh, that's the only objective gold standard? Yeah, so we're teaching our trainees to make a pre resection diagnosis of the histopathology mm -hmm. based but on. But also size, I mean? Well, size is, you can do that. Uh, but size, of course, if you don't pin the specimen, um, it becomes more difficult because the specimens curl up in the formalin. So, um, uh, so um, yeah, I think size not so much, but histology definitely. People should be making a histological diagnosis and then marrying it up with their pathological results when they receive them. That's right. But but to go back to size, there's no really good training module for... I don't uh, think so, unless you can Whether you, you say five millimeter, but in fact it's nine. And, um, it probably doesn't matter know. whether it's yeah, okay. between two and seven okay. or eight. Yeah. Bear in mind, just th that we don't get sidetracked, but cold snare resection above eight, then you're going to start to get stalling and protrusions more frequently above eight millimeters. And that becomes a problem because uh, if you have to amputate against the end of the scope, then I think there is, there's a recent paper showing that there's a risk of residual adenoma. Although in the original study that we did in 2013, we, we found no residual adenoma in 230 protrusions or something like that. So the conclusion is size is important, but the precision is so-so, and we are all waiting for artificial intelligence or whatsoever laser measurement uh, that we get rid of that. Yeah, but it's probably not going to be so important size. It's it's more about pathology. Yeah, but pathology. you know, all the risk classifications and all the literature and advanced adenomas, but yeah, anyway. But, but, but uh, size, I would say, if you mm -hmm. get a bunch of people in the room, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're the, the confidence interval is going to be, it's not going to be so wide. So if it's a few millimetres either side, it doesn't matter. Okay, before we go to the images, what have we forgotten? Scope position, we've size forgotten, measurement, location? We've forgotten overall morphology because... Uh, no, that's the image part. Oh, yeah, but, okay. uh, General oh. principles? Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Um, cleaning, washing? Cleaning, washing. I mean, we assume that the patient's been appropriately consented for the procedure and all the pre resection, uh, pre-colonoscopy factors have been considered, the day surgery setting, do you have all the equipment you need, all of those things. Sedation is a different topic for... Sedation uh, is, we have written quite a bit on sedation recently, but um, sedation is a big topic, but we can't cover it here. Okay, you, you your personal uh, we, approach? We do our own sedation. Propofol? Uh, propofol. General yeah. anesthesia in very big ones? Uh, so general anesthesia for... Um, Frail patients? Frail patients, very complex procedures, patients that need to be rolled a lot for long procedures that can take a couple of hours. Um, and also for all upper GI ESD, we do a lot of upper GI ESD. So, yeah. So I think we have been setting the level too high. We should, uh, I'm a big fan of NS, uh, general anesthesia. So, but, but mm. anyway, so mm. there, there's a mixture. Mm.